One of the things that this book actually talks about is the importance of semantics, is the importance of language, of discourse. We always say that semantics actually matter, and it matters because it will tell you a story about a certain uh, country that will bring with it a um, um, long list of um, um, stereotypes, of, of portrayal, of sometimes exaggerating about certain um, aspects of an event that will not help the story. I mean, in the same way as we can't generalize about the entire region, um, you can't even generalize about countries within that region, really. I mean, uh, and I think you can't necessarily generalize about Western reporting. There's some very good Western reporting, some very bad Western reporting. I think there's also um, a particular difficulty for, for journalists in how to deal with authoritarian, how to report on authoritarian uh, contexts because you go into places that you know people do not necessarily have the freedom to, to speak out or to talk to you in um, so what do you so there, there is um, a lack of information there is a difficulty of, of access so that, that is um, a particular challenge I think that, that journalists face when it comes to um, when it comes to the Middle East when it comes to Syria story the unfairness of the reporting because and here I, I want to generalize, uh, including Arab media. It's not anymore about the people. It's about ISIS only. But since 2012, if you go on the ground and you see those villages, they're not the vast majority of ISIS. I mean, you know Syria well. The Syrian regime was winning the media war in Syria because of the ill performance of the opposition in the media. So they won. I think it's a very big question who won the media war in Syria, but I think you can make a very convincing case that the Syrian government did, yes. Um, that said, I mean, if you think if you ask most people in this country who take, you know, as most audiences do, only a passing interest in what's going on there, I think most of them would see President Assad's administration as being the bad guys in many cases. The chapter is called On, on the Afterlife of False reporting because I, I make the point that even when a new story is, is false it doesn't mean that it somehow uh, is no longer is, is no longer relevant because these these stories are part of, of a discourse that political players um, that you try to use for their own advantage so in, in that case yes the Syrian government <coughs> tried to use it as okay look this is um, this is obviously fake news therefore we can uh, we can expand kind of that that uh, conclusion and say oh everything uh, you cannot trust e anything on the internet anything on, on YouTube Western reporters have either a medium or especially a good handling of spoken Arabic it seems that there are very very few of them I think that has a big effect because there are huge subtleties in it which simply get ignored C could you comment on that I can speak Russian <laughs> Uh, now the reason I mention that is because when I was travelling with colleagues in Russia who didn't speak Russian, I could sense what they were missing. And I realised, and I'm absolutely frank about this, that when I was in the Middle East, I was missing that too. I was missing sitting, you know, in a cafe and just hearing what was going on around me. I was missing sitting in a taxi and hearing what was going on around me. I was missing consuming local media. So I fully endorse what you say. Do you think the narrative of 9-11 and the war on terror has changed how Western audiences look at and understand the region's current events and also its history? The way that being, um, um, you know, how, how Islam and Muslims and, and how terrorism became synonymous with being Muslim or, or uh, the religion of Islam and also how being Arab became synony synony synonymous to being Muslim. Um, and that, you know, being Arab means being Muslim, and, and you, you're from the Middle East. Before 9-11, the Middle East was mainly related to Palestine, Palestine, Israel. The danger that people put themselves in, maybe when they're reporting, say, in conflict and things. Um, do you think that's getting worse as a lot of journalists struggle to find a job, and therefore freelance maybe put themselves in more risk to get the story as a freelancer without the support of, sort of a big um, news agency behind them. I'm not sure if the danger is always a bomb or a kidnap or being raped or all of this. The danger in this career nowadays is being misled 
and to fall in the trap of information that's coming to you from governments, from activists, from all this wide array of people who are trying to influence the course of events.